Dead America, the second month. Atticus on the Rails, part one. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter one. Day zero plus 43. Seattle rebuild, day 13. Atticus stretched out in his comfy bed as the sunlight began to peek through the blinds. It had barely been a week since he'd landed the new digs for him, his ten-year-old daughter Susie, and his friend and babysitter Evelyn. But he'd already settled in. After more than a month of barely sleeping, staying in whatever fortified structure they could find, having a comfortable bed was a godsend. He forced himself to get out of bed, rolling his six-foot frame up and stretching. He ran a hand over his bald head before walking over to the window, looking out at the city from his high-rise apartment. He smirked to himself at the realization that it took the apocalypse for him to be able to have a home like this. There was no way his old Texas Ranger salary could have ever afforded him this level of luxury. It wasn't that he would have spent the money on a place like this anyway. He was a small-town guy, but being here in Seattle meant that Susie and Evelyn were completely safe, so it was a sacrifice he was willing to make. Plus, it did have its benefits, like fresh coffee being made in the next room. The scent hit him, and he breathed deeply, smiling. I could live to be a hundred and never get tired of that smell, he whispered to himself and stretched one more time before shedding his pajamas. He pulled on his jeans and a dark blue flannel shirt, popping his cowboy hat on his head before emerging from the bedroom. As soon as he crossed the threshold, Susie squealed with excitement, running away from the TV and barreling into his midsection. Daddy, she cried. Oof he joked, feigning that she'd knocked the wind out of him. There's my baby girl. How you doing? I'm fantastic, she declared, pulling back from him with a big grin. Fantastic, huh? He asked with a chuckle. Why are you fantastic? Susie spread her arms. Because Miss Evelyn made me a big omelette for breakfast and let me watch my favorite movie, she said. Omelette, huh? Atticus said appraisingly, peering into the kitchen with curious eyes. Don't suppose you have enough to make me one of those, do you? I would love to, Evelyn replied, but you don't have time. She pointed to the clock on the wall with her spatula, and he stared at it, wrinkling his nose when he realized it was just past eight. Ugh, guess that bed is more comfortable than I thought, he muttered with a sigh. Don't worry, though, Evelyn said pushing a brown paper bag across the counter next to a paper cup full of steaming coffee. I made you a little something to eat while you walked to your appointment. Atticus grinned as he picked up the spoils and took a sip of the delicious brew. Hope a couple of breakfast tacos are okay, Evelyn said. Ma'am, I'm from Texas, Atticus drawled. If there was an official state food, the breakfast taco would be in direct competition with brisket. Susie pouted deeply. You have to go already, Daddy, she whined. He set down the bag and cup and knelt beside her. Just for a little bit this morning. Then I'll be home, he promised, taking her by the shoulders. But you're going away soon, aren't you? She asked, all fantastic bubbliness from before evaporated. He nodded, smoothing her hair back over her head. I am, baby girl, he said gently but it won't be for too long. I have to make sure that you and Evelyn and everyone else have plenty of food to eat. You understand? I do, she said with a solemn nod. I just miss you when you're gone. I know you do, Atticus said and kissed her forehead. I miss you too, but I tell you what, when I'm out, I will find you a few more movies for your DVD player. Would you like that? Her eyes lit up. Yes, she cried. I want all the movies. He laughed and pulled her into a tight hug. Yep, that's my girl, he said, 
and kissed the top of her head before collecting his breakfast again. I shouldn't be longer than an hour this morning. Should I get your bag and gear ready? Evelyn asked, wiping her hands on her apron. If you don't mind, Atticus replied. I don't think I'm leaving until tomorrow, but you know how these things sometimes go. Evelyn nodded. People want their stuff yesterday, she said. Apocalypse or no apocalypse. He nodded in response, then added, While you're packing, try to think of something you want while I'm out. She planted her hands on her hips and fixed him with a stare. Atticus, I'm just fine, she said firmly. I have everything I need. He raised a palm in surrender. If I'm going out, I might as well keep an eye out, he insisted. Just please, pick something. It'll help me out, I promise. He didn't spell it right out, but he appreciated Evelyn so much, and everything she did for his daughter. He really wanted to bring her something, even just a small token of his appreciation. She pursed her lips, nodding shyly. Okay, I'll think of something, she said quietly. Now come on, time's a-wasting. You have to get out the door. She shooed him with her hands. Okay, okay, Atticus said, and turned to Susie. Bye, baby girl. You behave yourself for Miss Evelyn here. Susie crossed her arms defiantly. Hey, I always behave, she declared. Then you have nothing to worry about, her father said with a wink. As he approached the door, somebody knocked at it, and he paused, glancing back at Evelyn. My meeting wasn't here, was it? he asked. She shook her head, brow furrowing. Nope, at the cafe like usual, she said. He walked to the door, holding the paper bag and coffee in one hand to open it. On the other side stood a young man in a crisp military uniform. Atticus Winwood? he asked. Yes, Atticus replied, cocking his head. Sir, I need you to come with me, the soldier said. Atticus blinked at him. Um, no, he said. The soldier opened his mouth and closed it again, clearly flustered that a civilian would say no to him. Sir, I must insist, he stammered. What is this about? Atticus asked with a sigh. Corporal Gad and Clint Rensfold need a word with you, the soldier said, firmness returning to his tone as he relayed his important mission. Atticus shrugged. Okay, tell them I'll meet them at their office in an hour or so, he said. The soldier shook his head. Sir, I'm afraid that I must... Let me stop you right there, the larger man cut in with a sigh. He just wanted to eat his damn tacos. I'm not military, so you don't have any control over me. Now, I know full well that I have a special deal with them, but that doesn't mean they own me. I have a meeting to attend, after which I will gladly go to their office and indulge them in whatever they desire. The soldier raised his chin. Sir, this is time-sensitive, he said. Oh, really? Atticus asked unable to keep the sarcasm from his tone. Time sensitive, huh? Tell me, soldier, when does the next train depart? The soldier blinked rapidly. I'm sorry, he asked. The train, Atticus repeated slower this time. When does the next train depart for the eastern stops? Oh, uh, the soldier stammered, shaking his head. I don't think it leaves until noon. And what time is it right at this very moment? The larger man pressed. The soldier pursed his lips. A little after eight, he replied dryly, finally catching on to what was happening. So, there's almost four hours before the next train leaves, Atticus said. The soldier sighed. Yeah, he trailed off quietly. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that, Atticus pressed. Yes, you are correct the soldier replied petulantly. Fantastic, Atticus said brightly, inspired by Susie. So, it doesn't matter if I meet with them right now or an hour from now. That time-sensitive issue isn't going to change because I can't do anything about it until noon. So if you'll excuse me, I have a meeting to attend to. Is there anything else? The soldier opened his mouth, but no words came out. Appreciate it, soldier. Atticus said, patting his shoulder as he walked by him. You have a good morning, and tell them I'll be there soon. The soldier's voice still failed him, 
and he stared helplessly at the ex-ranger's form. He looked down the hallway and then back into the apartment, where Susie stood in the doorway. She stared up at him, then gave an exaggerated wave. Bye-bye, she said, then slammed the door in his face. The soldier flinched before shaking his head, exhaling loudly and heading for the stairs. Meanwhile, Atticus stood in the elevator, polishing off one of his delicious tacos. Bopping a little to the tune playing from the speaker, bringing a smile to his face. Almost like living in civilization again, he thought. The elevator dinged as it reached the lobby, and he stepped out into a hive of activity. People and soldiers set up tables in the ballroom, carrying boxes of various goods inside. Atticus stopped by a soldier who stood by the reception desk with a clipboard. What's going on? he asked. The soldier glanced up from his list. We're doing some job interviews here this week, he said. Thought they were doing that up at the stadium, Atticus asked, brow furrowing. The soldier shook his head. Little too chilly outside, so they're bringing it inside, he explained. What kind of job interviews are you holding? Atticus wondered. The soldier perked up. Why? he asked, a little too interested. You looking for work? Atticus chuckled, waving him off. Nah, man, I got a job, he said. Just curious, that's all. Darn, I get bonus rations if I find a good recruit, the soldier said, tapping his pen on the clipboard with regret. But yeah, we're doing technical interviews here. Technical interviews? Atticus asked, cocking a brow. Yeah, jobs where people run computers, machines, and other stuff that's way above my head, the soldier said. Don't have a huge demand for it at the moment, but we're going to have to get back there at some point, so they want the best of the best in charge of it. Atticus shrugged. Zombies don't really care about computer programmers, huh? He drawled. The soldier laughed. Nah, man, doesn't really help us out there on the front lines, he admitted. But the higher-ups want to make sure all that knowledge isn't lost to history. Well, if you see a little old grandma who knows how to cook, tell her I got a job for her. Atticus choked. The soldier laughed again. You and me both, he quipped. Atticus extended his fist for a bump, and the soldier returned it with a nod. Happy hunting today, the ex-ranger said. You too, man, the soldier said, and turned back to his clipboard as Atticus headed off. He stepped outside, the brisk air hitting his face hard. He shivered a little bit, realizing he probably should have grabbed a jacket on the way out. Instead, he downed a big gulp of hot coffee, which did the trick of warming him some. Only a couple of blocks to the cafe, he thought. You're good. He broke out the second taco, eating it as he walked through the surprisingly busy downtown streets. There were no motorized vehicles, but several pushcarts being pulled by horses and pushed along by soldiers or stout civilians, all filled with goods. The scene was a weird visual mix of a modern big city downtown and an old west town where you had to watch your step on the road. Atticus didn't mind it. Honestly, having the horses around reminded him of home in Texas. The walk was a quick one, made quicker by him keeping a quick pace due to the cold. He finally made it to the cafe, which had a small line inside as soon as he crossed the threshold. It was counter-service with a couple of people behind it, one working a grill and the other taking orders. Atticus looked around, finally spotting Mr. Benedict, sitting in the corner, waving at him. He waved back at the balding older man, motioning to his coffee cup that he was going to get a refill. Benedict held up a carafe of coffee in return, and Atticus grinned, walking over. Mr. Windward, good to see you again, Benedict greeted, refilling the paper cup as he sat. Please, just call me Atticus, the ex-ranger insisted. My apologies, Atticus, Benedict said. Before the end, I was in the country club lifestyle, which was a necessity for my business. Even with the dead rising, it's difficult for me to lose those formalities. Atticus nodded and raised his now full cup in a toast. Old habits die hard, he declared. Benedict chuckled and raised his mug. Hear, hear, he agreed, 
and they took a sip. So, Mr. Benedict, tell me what I can do for you, Atticus asked, leaning back in his seat. I've been told by some associates of mine that you have freedom of movement outside the city, Benedict replied. Is this correct? Atticus nodded. It is, he said. Wonderful, Benedict replied with a smile. They also tell me that you are the one to speak to if I need an item retrieved. Atticus cocked a brow. Not sure who these associates are, but they are correct. I will retrieve just about anything, as long as the price is right. And if it is within a reasonable distance of the main train line that runs between here and Kansas. As much as I'd love to say I could head down to Florida to get your family heirloom, I'm afraid the flights are a little delayed at this point. Believe me, Atticus, I didn't want to go to Florida when things were just fine out there, Benedict said with a chuckle. I would never send you or anybody there during the apocalypse. Atticus laughed. That's appreciated, Mr. Benedict, he said with a nod. So, what can I retrieve for you? There's a small town about twenty miles south of Spokane called Spangle, the older man said. Have you heard of it? Atticus thought for a moment, then shook his head. No, I haven't, he admitted. Not surprising, Benedict said. Only had about 250 people living there. You know the old saying, one stoplight town? This is the town they were talking about. Been through many of those towns out in West Texas, Atticus said. Kind of fond of them, actually. Nice laid-back lifestyle to them, which is why I'm confused as to why a big businessman such as yourself would be interested in anything that town possessed. Benedict tapped his temple. You are as sharp as my associates said you were, he said. Despite my successes in life, I had humble beginnings. I had a teenage mother and was raised by my grandmother who spent most of her life in Spangle. My grandfather ran the seed plant there for decades. Seed plant? Atticus asked, eyebrows raising. Storage facility for the local farmers and their crops, as well as a storefront, Benedict explained. Wasn't a huge operation but it provided fresh produce to most of the restaurants in Spokane who were into that farm-to-table lifestyle. Atticus nodded slowly. We all come from somewhere, right? he asked. We do indeed, Benedict agreed. So, what am I getting for you? the ex-ranger asked. There is a moderately sized house on Pine Street, number 404, Benedict explained. This was my grandmother's house. She passed a few months before this began, and the house was locked up tight. Spangle isn't exactly a hot real estate market, so I was going to spend the holidays down there trying to figure out what to do with the place. Best laid plans, Atticus murmured. Benedict nodded. Indeed, he said. There are a couple of heirlooms in there that I would like returned to me. Let's make a list, Atticus said. It's simple, Benedict said. There is a framed 8x10 portrait of me with my grandparents that sits on the fireplace mantel. And in the bedroom, there is a jewelry box that has my grandmother's engagement ring in it. I would like that as well. Atticus nodded. Anything else? he asked. Anything from your mother? The other man shook his head. No, he said. She abandoned me when I was a child. She doesn't deserve to be remembered. Understood, Atticus replied. Now... Let's talk price. Name it, Benedict declared. My going price for something like this is twenty rations, paid half up front as a non-refundable deposit, and the rest upon delivery, Atticus said. Benedict cocked a brow. Non-refundable deposit? he asked. I assume that if you are unsuccessful that it's because you don't come back. So why would you need the rations? If I'm not here to use them, then my daughter and her caretaker will. Atticus explained. Understandable, Benedict said, and stroked the handle of his mug thoughtfully. However, your price is a steep one. Are you negotiable? Already have shelter taken care of, so food's the only other necessity, Atticus said. But I'm always open to hear what others have to say. While I don't have the influence I once did, Benedict said, I am still a businessman with connections, and as luck would have it, Several of my former associates survived long enough to make it here, and they owe me. Atticus chuckled. 
Why am I not surprised? He drawled. Tell me, Atticus, do you want your daughter to have an education? Benedict asked. The ex-ranger shrugged. Doesn't every father? He replied. I assume so, Benedict said. Haven't heard of them opening up any schools yet, Atticus mused. It is on the back burner, Benedict explained. However, one of the people who owes me is starting up a small academy for specially selected students. I make one call, well, I stop by for a face-to-face -face and your daughter is in. Best education in town, and arguably the world, depending on how other nations have fared. Atticus cocked a brow. So you want to do an even swap, he asked. Your heirlooms for an education. Benedict reached into his pocket, pulling out a handful of rations and peeled off five of them, tossing them onto the table. In my experience, a child's mind is most receptive to learning when their stomach is full, he said. So five rations, and she has a seat in the academy. Because you have to think, zombies will need to be killed for years, if not decades, and they're not going to be sending the most educated out to fight those battles. Atticus thought for a moment, taking another long sip of coffee, before nodding. Okay, you have a deal, he finally said. Five rations and an education. Wonderful, Benedict said, raising his mug in thanks. Do you know how long this venture might take? I have a couple of other stops lined up for this trip, and I have to go meet with a couple of guys with the military who apparently need an errand run for them, Atticus said. Clint and Corporal Gad? Benedict asked. The very same, Atticus confirmed. The businessman smiled. They're the ones who gave me your name, he said. Spoke very highly of you. By all means, take your time in returning. I was just curious. Depending on what errand they have for me, I would say a few days, Atticus said. Hopefully no longer than a week. I look forward to seeing you then, Benedict said. Please, travel safe, and give my best to Clinton Gad. He held out his hand to shake. Atticus shook and nodded. With pleasure, he replied. Thank you for the coffee and the work. He got to his feet and tipped his hat before heading out of the cafe. As soon as he got back outside, a grin spread across his face. More food for the pile, and got my girl an education. Couple of weeks into this and business is already booming. Chapter 2 Atticus walked up to the open office door and stood there for several moments, watching the two men frantically work on stacks of paper and move stuff around on maps. Clint used his sleeve to erase numbers off of a whiteboard and write new ones down, causing Gad to smack his head on the desk. No, no, not that set of numbers, he cried. What? What did I erase? Clint asked, putting a hand to his forehead. The set of numbers we just spent the last hour on, Gad groaned. Oh, shit. Wait, I can't remember what they were. Clint babbled, furiously writing on the whiteboard. Hang on. No, 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 Gad assured him. It's fine. I think I jotted them down on a piece of paper here somewhere. Atticus burst out laughing, unable to help himself, and both men whipped their heads to look at him. While I have no doubt that we're in great hands, it's a good thing that the people can't see how the sausage is made, he drawled. Gad let out a defeated sigh as Clint laughed, shaking his head and motioning for Atticus to come inside. Appreciate you coming by on short notice, he said, extending his hand to shake. Atticus shook and smiled. It was part of our deal, I'm happy to, he said. Sorry my morning meeting took a little longer than expected. No problem, Clint replied, waving him off. Still plenty of time before the train leaves for North Platte today. North Platte? Atticus asked, blinking. You're sending my ass to Nebraska? Some of those hippie farmers been slipping you some of the good stuff? Actually, yeah, they have, Clint admitted. But that's not why we're sending you. Atticus took a seat and watched as the other men dug through a few maps before pulling out the one he was looking for. As he spread it out, Atticus could see it was a country map, with the northwest marked up. 
a long line snaking its way from Seattle all the way down to North Platte. All right, lay it on me, he said. How much do you know about the military retreat into Kansas and the movement out there? Clint asked. I mean, I know y'all retreated to Kansas to regroup and then trained it up here, Atticus replied with a shrug. Other than that, not much. Okay, so North Platte, Nebraska is the biggest train yard in the country, Gad explained. Since the rail lines eventually ended up here, we used it as a hub to move man and machinery up here. However, with a retreat that size with a civilian population as significant as the one in Kansas, we had to leave a residual force, Clint added. Atticus nodded thoughtfully. How many we talking? he asked. Officially? Gad asked. Five hundred. Atticus cocked a brow. And unofficially? he asked. Clint sighed. We don't know, he admitted. Don't know? the ex-ranger asked dryly. What do you mean, you don't know? I mean, I know the force that was ordered to stay behind and what their numbers were, Clint replied. But with the chaos of moving that many troops across the country into a war zone, and no easy way to figure out who died or who was even there in the first place, I don't have an exact answer. Could easily be in the thousands for all we know. Atticus's brow furrowed. What makes you say that? he asked. Morale isn't exactly the highest it's ever been, Gad explained. And it was a whole lot lower when we were in Kansas when the orders came down to mobilize. Atticus nodded slowly. You're worried about deserters, aren't you? he asked. Yeah, we are, Clint confirmed. We don't have hard facts, only anecdotes from soldiers that have worked their way up to us. What kind of anecdotes? Atticus asked. Stories about one of their buddies going AWOL in Kansas? Gad replied. How they hopped off the train in the middle of the night, that kind of thing. The ex-ranger crossed his arms, leaning back in his chair. Why would they stay behind in Kansas? He asked. No firm answer. However, you have to remember that the military went through and cleaned it out. At least all the small towns, that is, Clint explained. The bigger cities were contained as best they could until we left. Atticus took a deep breath. So, what do you need me for? he asked. We need you to head to North Platte and see what you can see, Clint said. Our communications there went down yesterday and haven't come back up. Could be nothing. Or could be that the troops deserted their post, Atticus pointed out. That's another possibility, Gad agreed. However... He glanced over at Clint, who shrugged in response, but neither man said anything, and Atticus bristled. Either tell me what you're silently debating, or I'm getting up and walking out and you guys can deal with this on your own, he demanded. Clint sighed. We heard some disturbing anecdotes from multiple sources who came through different podunk towns, he began. Okay, Atticus replied. Tell me. There are stories of massacres, Gad said. Dozens of civilians riddled with bullets, almost like the town was being cleansed. They weren't zombies? Atticus asked. Clint shook his head. According to the stories, people were shot in the back, blood pools, the whole nine, he said. They were alive when they were shot. You think the deserters have something to do with it? Atticus asked. Gad took a deep breath and shrugged. I'll be honest, we have no idea what to think, he admitted. So why send me? Atticus asked, pointing to himself. Sounds like you have a major problem on your hands. Why not dispatch some troops and see what's what? Because if it is a group of deserters, then we have two problems, Clint said. Soldiers aren't exactly fond of turning their weapons on their own, especially in a conflict like this. Atticus nodded. And? he asked. And our biggest fear, Clint said with a defeated sigh. If deserters are doing this and have managed to set something up in Kansas, the troops we send down there just might decide to desert too. The ex-ranger pursed his lips for a moment. And you think I'm coming back, he said. I think with Susie here that you'd wipe out half the state just to come back, Clint replied. 
I know you're not going anywhere without her, and I know you're a man of your word. If you say you'll look into it for us, then I know you will. Atticus leaned forward, resting his arms on the table. So, what do you want me to do? he asked. First step is to get down to North Platte, Gant said, tapping the map with his finger. Now we can't risk the train getting that close, so they'll drop you off a few miles outside of the train yard. Hope you're not afraid of a little exercise, Clint added. Atticus ignored the joke and asked, So, North Platte, and then what? See what you see, Clint replied simply. Maybe it's something innocent, like a zombie mob came through and forced the communications team out. How far do you want me to push it? Atticus asked. Gad cocked his head. What do you mean? he asked. Say I get down there and the communications team is gone, or dead from a bullet to the head, the ex-ranger clarified. How far do you want me to push it? You want me to go down into Kansas, interrogate some folks if I can find them? The other men shared a look, having another silent debate, albeit a shorter one this time. I trust your judgment, Clint said firmly. If you think you have a lead you can safely investigate, do so. If the trail turns cold, it turns cold. Come back and report what you find. Oh, and I have a contact for you at the last stop before North Platte, Gant said, holding up a hand. It's a little town called Moorcroft in Wyoming. It's about 350 miles away, so it's a haul, but it's a fully functional outpost. We do have communications set up there with a direct line to us. The contact's name is Linda. Nice girl. Spoken to her a few times now. She'll be aware that you're coming, so she can help you out with whatever you need. Okay. How am I getting there? Atticus asked. Train leaves whenever you're ready, Clint replied. The ex-ranger nodded. Okay. I need to make a couple stops on the way, he said. Shouldn't take more than a few hours at each stop. The duo stared at him, brows furrowed with concern. I see that look, and I get it, Atticus admitted, raising his palms. It's time sensitive. Rest assured that getting to North Platte is a top priority. But I have business I need to attend to. And besides, I need to give North Platte time to settle down before I storm in there. Gad shook his head. You don't even know what happened there, he said. Okay, let's break it down, the ex-ranger said, flattening his palms on the table. If it's a mob of zombies that came in and drove your crew out, they need time to clear out. If it's a hit squad that came in and took them out, they're dead and not going anywhere, and the assassins will already be gone, so no real rush. Gad raised his chin. And if they defected? he asked. Then, if they're smart, they covered the tracks, Atticus replied with a shrug. If they're not smart, I'll find what I'm looking for anyway. Nobody's moving fast these days, so an extra six hours on my part getting there isn't going to change much. However, if I can knock out my work real quick, I know my family gets to eat and life is good. Besides, that train is going to need time to gas up, unload goods and people. Isn't going to take me long at all. And if it does, Gad asked, then I'll backburner it, Atticus promised. Shouldn't take more than three, four hours at these stops. Clint nodded. Okay, do what you need to do, he said. Gad shot him a surprised glance. Clint, he said firmly. What? Clint replied with a wave of his hand. The man knows what he's doing, and he has other business to attend to. Our deal with him wasn't for him to drop everything and come running when we whistled. It was to help us out when we needed it. Giving him a few hours in? Where are you stopping? Spokane and Helena, Atticus replied. Clint chuckled. See? Another problem he can handle, he said. What's that? The ex-ranger asked for. Mayor Hogan put in a request for some help yesterday, Clint explained. I said we'd get someone down there as quickly as we could but he thinks the problem is due to some soldiers and not exactly keen on having more soldiers investigating. Would you mind meeting with him? Atticus nodded. Not at all, he replied. Just add it to my tab. Is it confirmed that he's dealing with soldiers? The other two exchanged a look and he huffed, rolling his eyes. Guys, we've been over this, he said. Sorry, sorry. 
Gad gushed, raising his hands. You know that little issue we had you deal with a couple weeks back? Clint asked. The militia wannabes camping out by the lake that nearly took me out? Atticus asked dryly. Yeah, rings a bell. What about them? We've discovered in recent days that they're not alone, Clint replied. In fact, they might be the smallest group operating up here, Gad added. I knew this place was a hotbed of militia activity before all this, Atticus replied. You're telling me they're still active? Clint sighed. And generally not pleased with us, he said. What do you know? Atticus asked. Not much that's concrete, Gad replied. They have a huge base down in Bend, Oregon, that one of our soldiers kind of launched an assault on, Clint explained. So their entire network is most likely on high alert. Atticus blinked at him. Network? he asked. Still working to confirm this, but they claim to have numerous armies spread out all over the area, Gad said. Fantastic, Atticus huffed. We're still researching, Clint said quickly. But just be careful out there. You might be okay since you're a civilian. I just wouldn't play up the fact that you're working with the military if somebody with a gun asks you who you are. The ex-ranger sighed. Good to know, he said. All right, boys. Anything else for me? The other men glanced at each other and shrugged, shaking their heads. I think we're all set here, Clint said. Are you going home before you head out? Gad asked. Yeah? Why? Atticus asked. Gad got up and walked over to a bag on the floor. He dug through it and took out a few DVDs and CDs, setting them on the table next to Atticus. Saw these when I was at the processing facility yesterday, he said. There were stacks of them from one of the supercenters, so there will be plenty at the library once we get it back opened. But I thought that Susie might enjoy them while you're on the road for us. Atticus inspected the animated movies and pop music albums, nodding appreciatively. Thank you. This means a lot, he said. Is there anything I can look for out there for you two? Can't guarantee anything, but you never know. I have everything I need, but thank you, Gad replied. Clint? Atticus asked. The other man laughed. Two things I always need, he replied. Scotch and Silver Age superhero comic books. Classy man. I like it, Atticus replied, pointing at him. Consider it done. Be safe and drop us a message once you get to Moorcroft, Clint said. Will do, Atticus said, and gathered up his spoils before walking out of the office. He took a stroll down the hallway of the stadium towards the exit, gathering himself, because he knew the next few days were going to be rough. Chapter 3 Atticus sat in a passenger car that had been attached to the freight train, looking out the window as they moved through the wilderness of eastern Washington State. There were a few other people in the car with him, a few soldiers, but also a few civilians. There was a small table in front of him with a map of Spokane that had been marked up with his path, as well as a few strategic things like where the train yard was and some boundaries. This should be an easy in and out he thought, hoping he wasn't jinxing himself. Town of two hundred people that close to Spokane. I'll be surprised if there is a single zombie in place. He chuckled to himself, folding up the map and stuffing it into his bag, turning back to look out the window. The trees were whipping by them pretty quickly, with the occasional break in them revealing the landscape. Hills, water, mountains far in the distance— just beauty that he hadn't seen in a while. As he lost himself in the view, someone slid into the seat across from him. Beautiful, isn't it? she asked, and he turned his gaze towards a professional-looking woman wearing a business suit. She looked to be in her thirties, her blonde hair wound back into a tight bun. Never seen anything like it, if I'm being honest, he replied. She smiled. Not a local then, huh? she asked. No, ma'am, he replied. Ma'am, she asked with a laugh. With manners like that, you're definitely not local. Manners and the tinge of an accent. I'm going to say Texas. Atticus pointed to his cowboy hat sitting in the seat next to him. What gave it away, he drawled. 
The manners are what sold me, she said with a laugh. I used to work in the oil business and had to fly to Calgary from time to time. They used to call it the Texas of Canada. His eyebrows rose. The Texas of Canada? he asked. Wasn't aware there was such a place. Oh, yeah. Lots of oil money up there, she explained, which meant a lot of Texas oil men heading up there. Cowboy hats, boots, the whole nine. You'd see it all the time, at least during the summer. What, they all run away in the winter? Atticus asked with a chuckle. Well, we'd sometimes get five, six feet of snow over the course of a couple of days, she said. Hard to see much of anything other than white powder at that point. He laughed. Fair enough, he agreed. I'm Atticus Winward, he extended his hand. Julie McGee, she replied and shook. Pleasure to meet you. Likewise, he replied. So if you were in the oil business, what are you doing now? She chuckled. Oddly enough, I'm still in the oil business, she said. He cocked a brow. Wasn't aware that there was an oil business to be had these days, he said. Yeah, oil is starting to flow from the Canadian oil fields again, Julie explained. Refinery is back up and running, and we'll be pumping out more gas any day now. I'm on my way to Spokane to work with a few of the train engineers so we can get fuel transports ready to go. I'll admit, I didn't have you pegged as a get-your-hands-dirty-in-the-field kind of woman, he said. Don't get me wrong, she said with a ghost of a smile. I could mix it up with the best of them in my youth, but I'm a little long in the tooth these days. A young lady like you? he gasped. No. She shook her head, chuckling. Kind of you to say, she said. Completely blatant lie, but kind of you to say. Atticus laughed. I call them like I see them, he said. Bullshit, but I do love you for it anyway, Julie quipped. They laughed a little louder this time, drawing the attention of the soldiers at the other end of the car. Atticus caught their eyes and gave a little apologetic wave to settle them down. Yeah, might not have it in me to do the field work, but I know my stuff and can direct traffic with the best of them, she said. Given the population, you just might be the best in the world at what you do, Atticus pointed out. She blinked at him, and her grin widened. You know, I hadn't thought of that, she admitted. I'm going to start introducing myself that way. Julie McGee, the best oil specialist in the world. I like it, he said. So, what do you do? she asked, motioning to him. It's pretty clear you're not one of the military boys over there. Used to be a Texas Ranger, he replied. Now I'm a bounty hunter of sorts. She raised an eyebrow. Didn't think that was still a job, she admitted. Job description's the same, he explained. But the target is different. I'm headed to a small town in Spokane to retrieve some family heirlooms for a client. You hunt objects, huh? Julie asked thoughtfully. I could use a man like you from time to time. What do you charge? My rate starts at ten rations and goes up from there, Atticus replied. But if you have something unique, I'm always open to offers. Her lips curled into a smirk. Open to offers, huh? She asked, voice lowering a bit. I have no doubt we could work something out. He smiled slyly right back. No doubt at all, he agreed. She pulled out a business card and a pen, writing an address on the back of it and handing it to Atticus. When you get back from your current field trip, why don't you pay me a visit? She asked. You will be at the top of my list, he assured her. So you'd better start making your wish lists so we can start bartering. She licked her lips as the train began to slow down. She looked out the window as the trees broke and buildings emerged in the distance. Looks like this is my stop, she said with a sigh. You staying in town long? Just a few hours, I'm afraid, Atticus replied. Well, you better be safe out there, she said firmly. I hate being stood up for meetings. She gave him a wink and got up out of her seat, walking off. Atticus leaned out of his seat a bit to admire her retreating form, not disappointed in the view. He sat back in the seat, chuckling to himself. Yep, he thought. Still got it. Chapter 4 Atticus disembarked the train. 
a duffel bag over his shoulder and cowboy hat in hand. They were in a makeshift industrial train yard that was a hive of activity. Soldiers moved cars and goods around, swapped out train cars and rushed around everywhere. Excuse me, Atticus said politely to a nearby soldier. Can you tell me who is in charge here? That would be Sergeant Miller, the soldier replied, pointing. Tall fellow with the clipboard at the end of the platform. Atticus nodded his thanks and strolled over to the sergeant, waiting patiently for him to finish barking out a set of orders to some troops. Sergeant Miller? Atticus asked when there was a break in the yelling. Make it quick, because I'm busy as hell, Miller said gruffly, without looking up from his clipboard. Name's Atticus Winward, the ex-ranger said. Can you please point me in the direction of storage and transportation? Miller paused, looking up at him, taking in his civilian status and shaking his head. Are you military? he demanded. Atticus shook his head. No, but let me stop you right there, Miller snapped. You're at a military facility, so only military members can use what we have here, storage included. Atticus smiled, not losing the politeness as he reached into his bag and pulled out a laminated pass, tossing it onto the sergeant's clipboard. As I was saying, I'm Atticus Winward, and I need storage and transportation. Miller blinked down at the pass's military markings and the signature of General Stevens. The card was an all-access pass to go wherever he wanted, and for the military to cooperate with him, no matter what he needed. Apologies, Mr. Winward, Miller said, handing back the pass. Atticus is fine, the ex-ranger replied. Apologies, Atticus, the sergeant repeated with a sigh. Had my fill of civilians running around and acting like I work for them? Atticus raised a palm. Understandable, and no offense taken, he promised. So, what do you need from me? Miller asked. Need a safe place to store my bag and transportation that can get me a fifty-mile round trip, Atticus explained. Oh, and if you can spare someone with some knowledge of the situation on the ground that I could ask a few questions to, that would be great. Got a storage area by the exit over there, Miller said, motioning with a hand. I'll have a soldier meet you there to answer your questions and escort you to transportation. If you don't mind me asking, though, where are you headed? Spangle, Atticus replied. Small town about twenty miles south of here. Miller's gaze hardened. Not sure that's a good idea, he warned. Why's that? Atticus asked. Another soldier ran up to them, practically vibrating with wide eyes. I'll have my man fill you in, the sergeant said as he turned to his soldier. Just be careful. Will do, Atticus said, tipping his hat. And, oh yeah... This train isn't to leave until I get back. What? Miller cried in agitation. Do you have any idea what kind of shit show you're throwing on me? Direct orders from the top of command, Atticus replied with a shrug. But so I know, how long does it usually take you to get this train loaded up to head towards Helena? Four, maybe five hours, Miller replied. I should be back in plenty of time, Atticus promised. The sergeant nodded but his frustrated huff made it clear he wasn't happy about it. Please see that you are, he said. I got enough to deal with from civilians thinking they're special to military brass thinking I'm some sort of train wizard. Atticus chuckled and nodded. You have my word. I'll be back as quickly as I can, he said. Miller nodded and the ex-ranger walked off towards the storage area. He stepped out of the way of a few troops moving goods, looking around and admiring just how much was going on. He reached the storage area, which turned out to be a small office building with a soldier inside behind a counter. Can I help you? he asked. Yes, Sergeant Miller pointed me in your direction, Atticus explained. Said I could store some stuff in here for a few hours. Sure thing, the soldier replied. Just the bag? Atticus nodded, reaching in and pulling out a holster with his six-shooter. He drew out a handgun in its holster as well, and handed over the bag. The soldier wrote up a ticket and handed it back. Shouldn't be more than a few hours, Atticus said. Take your time, the soldier replied with a smile. There's always someone on duty, and we have plenty of room. Atticus nodded and patted the counter. Appreciate that, he said, as he pocketed the ticket. Another soldier entered. He looked young, in his early twenties. You Atticus? He asked, 
Yeah? You my contact? The ex-ranger asked. Private Harwell, nice to meet you, the soldier replied, and they shook hands. You mind if we hang out in here for a minute and chat? Atticus asked the soldier behind the counter. I'm going to be out in that cold all day. Just want to soak up the warmth while I have the chance. Take your time, the soldier replied with another smile. Atticus nodded and turned back to Harwell. So, what do you need to know? The private asked. I'm headed south of town to a place called Spangle, Atticus explained. Heard of it? Harwell shook his head. All those tiny one-stoplight towns run together after a while, he admitted. How far south is it? Twenty miles or so, Atticus replied. Oh, the private said flatly, brow furrowing in concern. Yeah, you probably don't want to go down there. It's my job, Atticus replied with a shrug. But why shouldn't I head down there? Part of the strategy with clearing out and securing Spokane was pulling those things away from town, the private began. Obviously, the ones in the middle of town weren't going to be susceptible to this strategy, but the ones on the edges of town would. So we set off several explosive devices south of town. Don't know how many we pulled away, but it was easily in the thousands. Probably in the tens of thousands, if you factor in the full operation. Fantastic, Atticus drawled. Have you been able to keep tabs on them? Harwell shook his head. Minimally, he admitted. We have barricades set up on the main roads about a mile south of town, with roving patrols running along the boundary. We have a few dozen encounters a day, which means the majority of those things we pulled out there are still down there somewhere. It's been, what, three, four weeks since we did that? No clue where they're all at, but I can guarantee at least some of them are where you want to go. What about any other contact? Atticus asked. The private furrowed his brow in confusion. What do you mean? he asked. Any armed encounters? Atticus clarified. Harwell shook his head, still looking confused. Not that I'm aware of, he said. Should we have? Nah, probably not, Atticus said. It's just, you know how some people get when the apocalypse comes. They get all trigger happy. Just wanted to know if I was walking into anything other than zombies. Harwell regarded him with narrowed eyes, clearly suspicious that Atticus wasn't speaking the whole truth. But Atticus wasn't tipping his hand any more than that. He knew that if Clint and Gad hadn't felt the need to share the militia threat with the rank and file yet, then it wasn't his place to do it. So, the sergeant says you need transportation, the private asked. Yeah, given the situation, what do you recommend? Atticus asked. Harwell motioned for the ex-ranger to follow him out of the building. He looked back and gave an appreciative wave to the soldier behind the counter and received a nod in return. As I'm sure you're well aware, fuel is at a premium, Harwell said as they walked. Yeah, might not be the case for long, though, Atticus replied. Had a nice chat on the train with someone working on the fuel situation. About time we had some encouraging news, Harwell replied. Still, at the moment, we're limited as far as transportation options. Full-sized vehicles are out. Only motorized vehicles we have are dirt bikes. Dirt bikes? Atticus asked, cocking a brow. Really? Harwell nodded. Really, he said. They can go over multiple terrains, and they get fantastic gas mileage. Perfect for patrolling the border. Guess I'll take one of those, then, Atticus said. Harwell walked him over to a staging area with various transportation options. There were several dirt bikes, some regular mountain bikes, and two pickup trucks loaded down with heavy machinery. Thought you said no full-size vehicles, Atticus asked dryly. Harwell grinned slyly. I meant for you, he said. Atticus barked a laugh. I got you. It's all good, he said, raising a hand. Dirt bike with a few gallons will square me away just fine. Harwell nodded and motioned to one of the soldiers to wheel one over to them. Harwell looked at the gas gauge, seeing that it was halfway full. There you go, he said motioning like a game show host showing off a prize. Should ride just fine. Appreciate it, Private, Atticus said with a tip of his hat. I'll return it in the same condition it's going out in. Honestly, it's fine if you don't, Harwell admitted. We have more of these than we know what to do with. We'll run out of gas well before we run out of machines. I'll let you know what I find out there, Atticus said. 
Harwell nodded as the ex-ranger took his seat, kicking the bike to life. He gave it a moment to warm up before flashing the soldier a grin and hitting the throttle. He pulled a little bit of a wheelie on his way out of the yard and turned south towards Spangle. Chapter 5 Atticus cruised down the highway to the south, headed towards Spangle. The ride had been a chilly one, but he didn't mind that all that much. It reminded him of being out on the range with a horse during the winter. The brisk air on his face, the emptiness, just him and his ride. Of course, it would have been nice if he were alone. He had to occasionally drive off-road, thanks to a pack of ghouls that were lumbering by. Nothing too major. The biggest pack he had encountered in the last few miles was half a dozen or so. They were easy to avoid, and he was moving too quickly for them to become a threat while he was retrieving his target items. The ride back, however, would be a little trickier, but it was nothing he couldn't handle. He knew that if he had survived the first month of this with Susie and Evelyn in tow, then this would be a walk in the park. Atticus slowed down when he spotted a road sign reading Spangle, two miles. This should be close enough, he thought. He pulled off of the road, hopping off the bike and popping out the kickstand. He parked it right beside the two-mile sign before checking his guns and tapping his boot where his large knife was hiding. Atticus went back to the road, looking down at it and seeing several small groups of zombies in the road, stretching as far as his eye could see. There were more zombies in his field of view than he'd seen his entire drive. I'd love to get closer, but can't be too careful, he thought. Besides, the exercise will do me some good. He left the bike at the side of the road and strolled down the middle of the highway without a care in the world. He looked around, admiring the view as he approached the first batch of zombies. From the looks of them, they were once a group of college-age kids. Now, however, they were the shambling masses, all of which were missing significant chunks of flesh from all over their bodies. Atticus did a little stretching about ten yards short of them, letting them come to him. The lead ghoul was a few steps ahead of the other two, which made him easy prey for Atticus and his blade. One quick stab to the side of the head, and it crumpled to the ground. He started to take a step towards the others, but instead took a couple steps back, making sure he was lined up with the body on the ground. He waited patiently for the other two creatures to get close, both of which stumbled over the corpse of their buddy. One of them fell flat on his face, while the other managed to stay on its feet. The stumbler went right past Atticus, who deftly dealt a strike to the back of its head, before yanking the blade out and jamming it into the top of the fallen one's skull. Atticus wiped the blood off on the clothing of the fallen, before turning his attention towards the others in his view. The next group was about fifty yards away, a pack of six. Only one of them had noticed him. I think I got the rust shook off pretty good, he thought. Might be time to hit the path of least resistance. Atticus walked off of the road, heading over to a barbed wire fence and using his knife to cut the tightly bound strands. He stepped through the opening into a large field, not much in the way of cover except for a few trees far in the distance. He made his way a hundred yards or so away from the highway, close enough that he could keep an eye on it, but far enough away that he had time to react to any major danger. As he walked, he could see that the creatures were getting thicker and thicker. A mile or so passed and he spotted a small farmhouse up ahead in the distance, further away from the road. He checked his watch. Plenty of time. Couldn't hurt to check it out, he thought. Farmhouse like that just might have some bullets lying around. Can never have too many of those. Atticus adjusted course, walking towards the house. He looked back to the road, and it was very thick with ghouls. A few hundred, he presumed, based on the movement and lack of daylight through to the other side of the road. He drew his knife from his boot and approached the barbed wire fence that led to the driveway. He cut it like he had the last one, allowing him to safely move through. There were a handful of creatures between him and the house, 
maybe half a dozen or so within twenty-five yards. Only the one closest to him had taken notice and began shambling his way. Atticus looked back towards the road, and it was all clear for the good hundred and fifty yards between them. He shrugged to himself. What the hell? Let's give it a shot, he thought, and let out a low but still loud whistle, which got the attention of most of the other creatures in the driveway. They shambled towards him, and he began backing up slowly, going through the hole in the fence he'd just cut. He backed up a good fifty yards, slowly, while keeping eye contact with the creatures in front of him. When the last one in the line crossed the threshold of the fence, he picked up the pace. Atticus jogged around them, headed towards the house. He stayed far enough away from the leader that its pitiful attempt at reaching out for him drew nothing but air. It took him a minute to flank them properly, pulling them far away from the hole in the fence. Once he was satisfied that the zombies would follow him up, Atticus ran towards the still-standing part of the barbed wire fence. He picked up enough steam to leap over it without putting himself in danger of getting caught up in it. He landed on the ground with a bit of a roll, negating the impact somewhat. He quickly popped to his feet, rushing over to the last zombie who was in the driveway and not paying him any attention. He easily dispatched it with a knife to the face before turning his attention back to the creatures in the field. Atticus watched as they pushed up against the barbed wire fence, reaching out and pushing against it as hard as they could. Much to his relief, the barbed wire was strong enough to hold them back. It didn't bend at all, and held them in place. Okay, y'all stay right there, he said. I'll be back. He turned towards the house, a large two-story building that looked like it had been there for a century or so. The white paint was fading over the wooden walls, and there was a car in the driveway that looked like it hadn't moved since the end of the world, with weeds growing up around the tires. Atticus cautiously moved up to the porch, his knife in his offhand, gun hand hovering over his holster just in case. He peeked inside the window into the front dining room. The table was set, but there was no food or scraps. In fact, it didn't look like there had been any disturbance at all. He walked around the giant porch, which circled the entire house. He looked in every one of the windows, finding a nicely taken care of house with not much in the way of untidiness or disturbance. This changed when he reached the kitchen. Atticus peeked in through the back door window, seeing pots and pans on the stove. The white cabinets were splashed with long dried red splotches. He tried the doorknob, finding it unlocked and slowly opened it up. It caught on something which put him on edge. He peeked slowly around the corner of the door and found the corpse of an older woman on the floor, an old revolver laying next to her. Oh, my dear sweet woman, what did you go and do to yourself? He murmured, staring down at the dead woman, shaking his head. He turned to the stove, wrinkling his nose at the putrid smell coming off of the rotting food in the pots and pans. He wasn't sure what to make of the scene, and shut the door behind him before carefully making his way through the house. He cleared the rest of the first floor rooms, which were all immaculate, like they'd been frozen in time from before the apocalypse. Atticus moved towards the stairs, listening carefully for any sound. He couldn't hear anything other than a faint hint of moaning coming from outside. As he walked by the front of the house, he looked outside, nodding to himself when he made sure the zombies he'd trapped were still behind the fence. As he passed the stairs, he noticed a hook by the front door with a set of keys hanging by their ring. He pocketed them before heading up the stairs. A strong stench assaulted him as he walked up to the second floor, very different from the spoiled food in the kitchen. The doors were all shut in the hallway, the only light coming from underneath the cracks at the bottom. Atticus moved towards the front of the house, which had two doors on either side of the stairwell opening. The first one he tried was a bathroom, which looked like it had gone unused for quite some time. The next was the master bedroom, featuring a perfectly made bed and a gun cabinet in the corner. Oh yeah, I'm coming back for you, 
he promised quietly, and worked his way around to the other side of the stairwell. The stench grew more intense, and he stopped outside of the first door, where it seemed to be the strongest. He knocked on it, listening for any movement, but nothing returned the sound. He opened the door, pushing it into the room. His heart immediately sank at the sight. Three bodies sat at the far end of the room. An older male corpse sat between two younger ones. They were all badly decomposed, with no bite marks. However, they were all tied together, with the man's arms curled around the children. All three of them had head wounds, blood splattering on the wall behind them. Well, I could have gone my entire life without seeing that, he thought. Damn. He assumed what happened was that the family knew what was happening to the sick, and measures were taken. It had all been too much for the old woman to handle, so she tidied up and ended things. Atticus went over to the bed, pulling off the comforter and draping it over the bodies, saying a little silent prayer as he did so. I hope you all find peace, he said solemnly, and walked out of the room, sealing them inside by shutting the door. He took a moment to breathe, clearing his head and getting it focused back on the task at hand. He checked the other room, which was another kid's room containing nothing of interest. He left before he could picture Susie in a similar predicament to these poor children. Okay, let's see what that gun cabinet is hiding, he murmured, and walked back into the master bedroom. The gun cabinet was unlocked. Well, that's not very safe now he thought, and opened it up. He found a couple of hunting shotguns inside, and inspecting them, finding them in pristine condition. They looked like they'd been rarely fired, and well taken care of. He opened the drawers, finding a few boxes of shells. Jackpot, he said, and looked through the rest, not finding anything of value. He moved over to the closet, opening it up and picking out an empty floral print purse and bringing it back to the cabinet. He didn't count as he dumped all of the shotgun ammo in it, but there were easily a few dozen rounds if he were guesstimating. Atticus went downstairs and headed outside, popping the trunk on the sedan and putting the guns and ammo inside before opening the door to the driver's seat. Okay, let's see what you got left in you, he said and turned the key. The engine sputtered for several moments before finally catching. Yeah, there we go. He let it idle for a minute, checking out the fuel gauge, which was completely full. Once he was satisfied, he turned it off, moving back to the trunk. Okay, good to know if I hit the jackpot down there, I can get it back to town, he thought, and loaded up one of the shotguns, squeezing a handful of shells into his holster, before shutting the trunk and slinging it over his shoulder. All right, let's knock this out so I can get back to town. He walked away from the house, headed south towards Spangle, which was little more than a mile away. Chapter 6 Atticus made it within view of Spangle, taking a knee a few hundred yards away from the northern edge of town. The entire place only stretched six blocks from east to west, with a seed plant on the northwest corner of town. There were several silos stretching a couple of blocks south, with houses beyond that and to the east. There were also dozens of zombies roaming about, some moving between the silos, with dozens more roaming the streets. Atticus sat there for several moments, contemplating what the strategy should be. Well... Whether I like it or not, I gotta find out which side of town this house is on, he murmured. He looked across the entire stretch of town, noticing that the zombies were more concentrated to his right. There were only half a dozen or so at the far end of town, to his left. Well, guess I could fight them off, get a look at the street sign, he thought. At least figure out which block I'm on. Atticus nodded to himself and got moving going over the tundra towards the east side of town. He stayed low while moving, trying to minimize his exposure to the zombies. It took a couple of minutes before he was in position, about fifty yards from the corner house in town. 
The front of the house facing directly to the east had a half dozen zombies directly in the road in front of it, just sort of standing there, waiting on something to draw them in any direction. Atticus looked down to the south along the outer road of town, where there were a couple dozen zombies scattered about, also just sort of looking around for a reason to move. He focused his attention on the corner house, noticing that the screen door was shut, but the wooden interior door was wide open. Better lucky than good, he thought, although it helps to be both. He chuckled to himself as he gripped his knife tightly, coming out from his crouched stance. He didn't run, just a slow, methodical walk. Not a hint of urgency in his pace, just cold and calculating. As he got closer to the street, he let out a clicking sound with his tongue, which got the attention of a couple of the zombies closest to him. They shambled his way, letting out an excited moan as they did. Atticus used his big boot to kick one in the chest before stabbing the other one in the head. He looked over at the other four nearby creatures, who were slowly moving his way, moaning. Atticus quickly took out the one on the ground before repositioning himself to take on the other four. As he waited for them to get close, he looked back down the street, relieved that only a couple of them had even turned in his direction. The next couple of creatures got close to him, and he employed a dart and strike technique, where he rushed forward, delivered a kill shot, then retreated quickly. This was effective when there were only a couple of creatures to deal with. He danced his way around the corpses, taking out the remaining ghouls close to him before surveying the situation. There were a few zombies down the street, slowly moving towards him, but they were still twenty-five, thirty yards away, and not drawing much of a crowd. He looked up at the street sign, finding that he was on the first street, which ran along the northern edge of town. The street running south was oak, prompting him to shake his head. Well, at least I know I need to go four blocks south, he murmured. Atticus walked to the entrance of the house, slipping inside and gently shutting the door. He quickly cleared the small older home, finding no movement inside. However, it appeared as though it had been ransacked at some point, with the kitchen completely cleaned out. Odd, he thought, and did a quick sweep for gun and liquor cabinets, finding neither. By the time he had finished that, a few zombies had wandered into the front yard looking around for him. They'd seemingly missed where he had gone inside the house, luckily. Atticus moved to the back side of the house, looking out at a few ghouls in the yard. It was nothing he couldn't handle, since they were spread out pretty well. He tried to look to the next road, but it was hard to tell what there was from his angle. Guess I'm just going to have to go check it out and improvise he thought. He didn't see a back door, so he moved over to a nearby bedroom and opened the window, sliding out and down to the grass as quietly as he could. He made a beeline to the closest zombie, jamming his knife into the base of its skull before it even knew he was there. He quickly looked around, figuring out the best path forward. There were a few zombies within twenty yards who had taken notice of him, but the path to the opening between two houses to the next street was open. He took off running, not concerned with the noise since he was on the grass. As he made it to the edge of the house, he saw several creatures on the next street, but only a handful and spread out pretty significantly. He couldn't see a street sign, so he started moving south, staying along the front of the houses. He ran by several homes, keeping an eye on the creatures that were spread out and slowly coming his way. He made it to the street corner, looking up at the signs to find himself on Second and Birch. He sighed. Bunch of hippie tree lovers in this town, he muttered, and continued moving south, the chorus of moans picking up behind him. He glanced back over his shoulder at the fifteen to twenty ghouls in pursuit. Luckily, their collective moans weren't loud enough to start pulling zombies from other streets. He made it to the next block before moving to the west, where there were only a couple of creatures on the road. Going to have to deal with them eventually, he thought, and rushed up towards the creature closest to him, jamming his knife into its eye socket and dropping it to the ground. 
He lowered his shoulder and knocked the other two down, quickly dealing with their bodies on the ground. Atticus scanned the immediate area with the next street fairly clear, at least in his vicinity, Third and Pine. Finally, he said under his breath. He turned to the south, moving quickly but quietly across the grass. There wasn't a zombie in sight in front of him, however the moans behind him seemed to move in a bit, especially as they came around the corner, still in pursuit. He continued walking south, hitting Fourth and Pine, he scanned the other side of the street, locating 404 Pine, but he didn't immediately head towards it. Doesn't do me much good if I get in there and can't get out, he thought, and pondered for a moment before going up to the front door of the house next to him. He peeked inside, finding not much in the way of carnage inside. He tried the door, but it was locked, so he resorted to kicking it in with his big boots. It took several attempts before the doorframe gave way. He was immediately greeted at the threshold by an older zombie, struggling to shamble towards him, barely moving a few inches with each attempt at moving its legs. Guessing you didn't get around too good before you turned, did you, old-timer? Atticus asked, and stared at the creature with pity for a moment, before driving his knife into its head. Atticus dragged it away from the door, leaving it propped open. He looked back towards the mob, which was about thirty yards and closing, just a couple dozen at most at that point. He moved through the house, clearing the common areas before going to one of the back bedrooms, completely unconcerned with rooms with closed doors, as he wasn't going to be sticking around long. The bedroom was nice and tidy, small too, most likely a guest room. He looked out the back, and there were a couple of zombies moving away from the house, likely attracted to the noise of the mini-mob that was pursuing him. He carefully opened the window, making sure not to make noise and bring them back. Once his escape was set, he walked back down the hallway towards the living room, stopping within view of the front door. Yeah, come on and get me now, he bellowed. I'm right here. He smacked on the wall a couple of times, making sure to draw them in as much as possible. He waited until several of them cleared the threshold of the door before walking into the bedroom. He left the bedroom door open, unconcerned at the threat behind him. He quickly climbed out, landing softly on the grass, looking back towards the few zombies that had been lumbering away just a few moments ago. They didn't notice him as they turned the corner of the house to join their brethren. Atticus moved along the back of the next house, stopping at the door and looking both ways, like he was looking for traffic. Much to his surprise, there were no zombies in that area, so he walked quietly across the pavement and down a few more houses until he was directly across from 404 Pine. He went up to the edge of the house, looking back down the street towards the diversion he'd set up with the ghouls inside the house. They had mostly piled in, with only a few remaining outside. There were a few zombies that had come out of hiding from the other side of the street, but they were slowly marching up towards the mob. Atticus waited a few seconds until they were clear, before making his move, walking gently on the pavement. He got to the front door, which had glass panels on the window. He looked inside, not seeing any disturbance. He knew the house was empty before the end, but couldn't be too careful when it came to desperate people looking for shelter. He took the hilt of his knife and jammed it into the corner of a small pane of glass on the door as softly, but forcefully, as he could. The glass cracked and fell to the ground inside. Atticus looked up the road to make sure that the sound didn't attract the creatures back to him, and luckily there was no response to his noise. He reached inside and unlatched the door, opening and shutting it silently. He immediately went over to the front window, pulling the curtains closed, save for a crack so that the sunlight would come in and help illuminate the room. Okay, let's do a little shopping and hit the road, he said, rubbing his palms together. Atticus went straight for the fireplace mantel, scanning the numerous framed photos sitting there. He found some as old as the early 1900s, with Mr. Benedict's grandparents standing on the family farm, 
albeit much younger than he would have remembered them. Finally, he spotted the photo on his list. He picked it up, admiring it for several moments. Benedict as a youngster, standing in between his grandparents, who appeared quite happy to have him there. Looks like you had a good childhood there, Atticus said softly. He set the frame back down on the mantel and moved over to a small writing desk that sat by the window. He looked through the drawers until he found a stiff photo envelope. Benedict had said he wanted the photo, not the frame, and it would be a lot easier to transport this way. He cracked open the back of the frame, pulling the picture from it and sliding it into the envelope. He lifted up the back of his shirt, tucking the envelope into the back of his pants, before tucking his undershirt in over it. He shifted and moved around a bit to make sure it was secure, and it was. Might get a little dinged up, but it'll get there, he promised himself. He moved to the master bedroom, which was completely dark. He pulled out a small flashlight from his pocket, shining it around. Jewelry box, jewelry box, he murmured, looking around. He couldn't find one sitting out anywhere, but spotted a large dresser with a set of double doors. Gotta be there. He moved over and opened it up, shining the light inside, finally spotting a large, ornate, antique jewelry box. Bingo! He reached in and picked it up, carrying it over to a large chest of drawers with a mirror and a countertop on it. Before he could open it up and find the ring, a gunshot went off outside. What the hell? he thought, his heart rate tripling. Atticus bolted to the living room, taking up position at the corner and peeking out through the crack between the curtain and the window frame. There were five armed men outside dressed in army fatigues. A couple of them fired shots towards stragglers, zombies, that were trying to get up to the house with the others. They were being put down one by one as another one of the armed men ran up towards the house with a Molotov cocktail. He lit it up and threw it in through the front door. It didn't take long for smoke to billow out from the front, flames soon to follow. The group laughed and whooped as they continued firing at the creatures who escaped the inferno. Several of them stood in the front yard of the house, speaking loudly enough for Atticus to hear. Okay, boys, you know the drill, the group leader said. Get into the houses and take everything useful that isn't nailed down. Food, ammunition, liquor, girly magazines. The rest of the men laughed at the last bit. He pointed to another man close to him. The two of us will worry about clearing the threat from the town, he said. Whatever you find, bag up and leave it on the doorstep. The pickup crew will be here in an hour, so we gotta move. Now, go. The rest of the men responded in the affirmative and spread out. One of them came straight towards the house Atticus was in, and his gut sank. He was a big son of a bitch, bigger than the ex-ranger himself. He looked like he'd come out of the womb working out. Damn it, he thought. So close. He looked back into the house, trying to decide what to do. He finally did the only thing he could, which was to retreat into the kitchen. He walked away from the entrance towards the dining area, kneeling down and placing his back against the short wall where the counter was. He took his hat off, setting it on the ground beside him so he wasn't spotted. Atticus was concealed, and there was nothing in the dining area that would bring the big fella his way. Just to be safe, though, he drew his handgun in one hand and the knife in the other. He listened as the man kicked down the front door, which was a bit of a relief to him as it was obvious he didn't notice that the door had already been broken into. The man didn't seem to care about preserving the house, with the sound of stuff being carelessly thrown about. A chair tipped over. Something crashed through the front window. It seemed like the guy was getting out some aggression, or just as a pitiful way of having fun. The footsteps got closer to the kitchen, coming in and throwing open the pantry doors. Son of a bitch, where the hell is all the food? He barked. Did these assholes not eat anything? He slammed the pantry door shut before opening up all the other cabinets, getting more and more frustrated as he did. The doors slammed harder and harder, and a few pots and pans were tossed about. Maybe something good in the bedroom, he muttered. If not, I swear to God I'm burning his place down on principle. 
Atticus waited as the man stomped off to begin ransacking the bedroom. As he did, the ex-ranger got up and walked softly to the edge of the kitchen, putting his hat back on like it was a priority, before sheathing his knife and getting his six-shooter ready. Horrific noise came from the bedroom, the mirror shattering and stuff being thrown around. Atticus positioned himself so that he was mostly out of sight, but he could see around the corner into the bedroom. He was mostly concealed by darkness, but there was light in the other room. After several moments, the large man came out of the bedroom, carrying the jewellery box, moving over to the window and pulling the curtains back so that he could get a better view. The man dug through the box, tossing out cheaper things before grabbing onto an antique, ornate ring, a big grin spreading on his face. Jackpot, the gunman declared, grinning and shoving the ring into his pants pocket. As he turned to leave the house, Atticus stepped out, cocking the hammer back on his gun for effect. The unmistakable sound froze the militiaman, and he froze in place, his back to the gun. He instinctively raised his hands in the air. I don't know who you are, he growled, but you're making a big mistake. Not the first, and won't be the last, Atticus admitted. It will be unless you make another one in the next sixty seconds or so, the gunman warned. We'll see, Atticus drawled. Why don't you go ahead and turn around for me, slowly, and keep those hands in the air? The gunman did as instructed, turning slowly with his arms high. You supposed to be some sort of cowboy or something? he asked. Six shooter and all? Something like that, Atticus said. Well, Mr. Cowboy, the gunman said with a sneer, you should know I'm not here alone. Oh, I know, the ex-ranger drawled. I also know I'm not dealing with the best and brightest. The gunman rolled his eyes. Ouch, hurting my feelings over here, he mocked. Call them like I see them, Atticus said. None of you stopped to think about why those things were crowded into a single house, and you didn't even notice I had already broken into this place. It's not because we're dumb, the gunman said petulantly. It's because we're not afraid of anything. Stupidity mixed with hubris, Atticus accused. Not a combination found in too many people who survived the apocalypse for very long. It worked pretty well for me up to this point, the gunman shot back. The ex-ranger cocked a brow. And yet, here you are with a gun aimed at your chest, he said. And why is that anyway, the gunman drawled. I had no idea you were here. You could have let me go and slipped out of town undetected. Doesn't seem like the smartest of moves on your part, Mr. Cowboy. Normally... I would have let you go and done just what you suggested, Atticus admitted. But as luck would have it, you grabbed the one thing in this place that I needed. The gunman stared at him for a beat before it clicked in his mind, his eyes widening. You want the ring in my pocket? he asked. Why? Because my client hired me to retrieve it, Atticus explained. And that's exactly what I intend on doing. The gunman chuckled. Client? he scoffed. What, you some sort of fancy cowboy courier? Something like that, Atticus replied. Look, I don't care what you do to this town. Loot it, ransack it, burn it to the ground. All I want is that ring. You give it to me, and I'll tie you up loosely enough that you can break free with a few minutes of work, and we go our separate ways. Everybody wins. The gunman jutted out his chin. Except me, he snapped. You'll still be breathing, Atticus reminded him. I'd call that a win, given your current predicament. But you'll be robbing me of something valuable, came the petulant reply. Plenty of people back at camp would fork over high-end whiskey for a ring like this. And besides, I don't think you're willing to kill over a stupid ring. Oh, believe me, I am, Atticus said, voice turning lethal. Question for you is, are you willing to die for that ring? The gunman smirked. Honestly, I don't think you got it in you, so... He trailed off and quickly reached for his sidearm. Atticus fired immediately, hitting him in the chest. The impact from the bullet sent him flying back against the wall, smacking hard and dropping to the ground. The ex-ranger moved over to him quickly, reaching into his pants pocket and pulling out the ring. He held it up in front of the dying man's face as he gasped for air. This is what you died over, Atticus said, shaking his head regretfully. 
a stupid ring. Funny thing is, you were completely right. I wouldn't have shot you over a ring. You could have turned and walked right out that door, and I would have let you. I'm a courier, as you put it, not a cold-blooded murderer. He wagged a finger. But you just had to try and draw on me. If it's any consolation, even if my gun was holstered, I still would have put you down. The man continued to gasp for air like a fish out of water. What the hell are you doing in there, Eddie? Someone barked from outside. Atticus approached the window, peeking through the crack in the curtains and spotting one of the militia members standing outside, looking confused. Come on, man, we got work to do, the man cried. Atticus got moving, bolting to the back bedroom and looking out, finding it clear. He opened the window and climbed out, just as the front door opened up. Yelling and panic erupted from the living room as the militia man came upon his dead friend. Atticus shook his head. Time to get the hell out of Dodge. Chapter 7 Atticus moved up a couple of houses towards the north end of town. He looked to the west, the highway in the distance, contemplating making a run for it. Don't be a moron, he thought bitterly. They didn't walk here, so if they spot you, then it's just a matter of time. Stay in town, get back to the farmhouse, and haul ass back to Spokane. He stopped at the next house, looking over to the road, seeing a few zombies and one of the militia members running by them. The gunman tripped up trying to get around it and stumbled. He fumed with anger, pulling himself to his feet before drawing his handgun and shooting it in the head. Take that, bitch, he cried. Several more zombies came after him, but he ignored them, running towards the house Atticus had just come from. The ex-ranger broke from cover, moving up a couple more houses until he saw numerous zombies in the side yard, a couple dozen more on the road, slowly shambling towards the south. He looked up and saw the seed plant a couple blocks up. Even from his vantage point, he could see numerous creatures in the lot. As he debated what to do next, a shot rang out from behind him, impacting the wall of the house just beside him. He turned and saw one of the militia members down a couple of blocks, aiming a rifle in his direction. Atticus hastily aimed his handgun towards the man, firing a couple of times while running back towards him, trying to get away from the mob of ghouls that were in between the next gap, especially since they were coming his way due to the noise. They exchanged several shots, both of them missing due to the distance, as Atticus made it to the edge of the house and behind cover. He was greeted by a mob of ghouls in the street who had turned their attention towards him. Atticus quickly scanned for a path through, but there was no clear-cut way. He quickly popped off the last two remaining shots from his handgun, taking a couple of them out who were behind one another. He took off running, fighting his way through the semi-spread-out mob in the street. As soon as he was clear of the house, there was gunfire coming from the southern part of town. Several people fired at him, so he ducked down as low as he could while keeping his momentum forward. Several of the bullets ripped through the zombies, sending chunks of flesh flying through the air, hitting Atticus as he ran. Somehow he managed to get across the street without being shot or grabbed by a ghoul. He didn't pause his sprint, going over one more street before darting into a house. The back door had already been kicked in, presumably by one of the militia members. When he got inside, he took a knee behind a wall, providing him cover and allowing him to see outside. He took a breather while he reloaded his handgun, sliding in one bullet after another. When it was filled back up, he took out the hunting shotgun, setting up inside the doorway and behind the wall, aiming it out towards the row of houses across the grassy area. The shotgun didn't have a scope, but the iron sights were straight and true. It wasn't the first time Atticus had used one of those, so aiming it properly wasn't a huge deal for him. He was patient, waiting for one of the gunmen to slip up and come looking for him. It was a tense wait, with the sound of gunfire echoing the next block over. Presumably the militia were taking out a few of the creatures who'd dared to get too close to them. Soon enough, 
one of them appeared at the edge of a house. He scanned the area, trying to figure out where Atticus had gone. He looked back, giving out hand signals to someone behind him before breaking cover. The man wasn't coming directly for Atticus, but going to the house directly in front of him, which was one over from where he was. Take him out, he thought, and squeezed the trigger. The booming sound rattled the glass inside the house as the slug flew through the air. It was a direct hit to the man's chest, sending him flying back onto the ground in a heap. Atticus looked, and the man flailed for a brief moment, before the last ounce of life left him. It only took a brief moment after that for bullets to begin ripping through the house. Atticus ducked behind the wall for cover, waiting for the barrage to cease for a second. As soon as it did, he came out from behind cover, firing a shotgun shell in the general direction of the other gunmen. Atticus didn't get a great look at them as he ran through the house to the front door. Bullets began flying again as he got out of the door and tore to the north, hoping to be able to escape town. He made it a block up, running by a few zombies as he did. Before the gunman could get through the house he fled, he doubled back. Atticus ran back to the west, towards the seed plant, hoping that the zombies had dispersed enough for him to get back through. As he reached the road, one of the militia members spotted him, yelling to the others and firing towards Atticus as he went. He didn't break stride or return fire, just pumping his legs as hard as he could. He made it within a block of the seed plant, spotting several dozen ghouls still there, most of which were shambling back in his direction. He knew he wouldn't be able to get past them and looked around frantically for alternatives. Just gotta make a run for the farmhouse, he thought, but I'm a sitting duck out there if they have a sniper, or anybody halfway decent with a scoped rifle. He thought for another minute, and then it clicked. He grinned to himself. Zombies. He ran hard for the mob, yelling at them as he did, getting the attention of as many as he could. When he was within fifteen yards of the marching mob, he made a hard right turn to the north, running hard towards the field just outside of town. Once he had successfully flanked them, he turned and fired his shotgun a few times into the air, not wanting to hit any of the creatures. Yeah, that's right, come and get me, he cried. He made it about fifteen yards away from the ghouls, then started walking backwards while reloading his shotgun. He matched the creature's speed, not wanting to put too much distance between him and the mob. That should at least put a buffer between me and those boys, he thought. Hopefully they weren't too close to the men I killed, and they gave up. He slammed the last shell into the shotgun and readied it. But if they come after me, they'll have to deal with me. The walk with the zombies went on for nearly half a mile, dozens of ghouls successfully navigating the open terrain, although a few tripped up now and then. Atticus kept his head on a swivel, looking for any sign of the enemy. He didn't have to wait long before spotting one of the militiamen about fifty yards away to his left, away from the highway. He ran alongside the mob, trying to get ahead of it to be able to take a shot. Atticus ran up about ten yards, buying himself a bit of time to stop and aim. He planted his feet, pulling up the shotgun and aiming downrange, getting the man in his sights. He squeezed the trigger, but missed as the man stumbled while running. Damn it! Atticus huffed. The militiaman regained his composure, turning and aiming towards Atticus, who took off running. He could see the farmhouse in the distance, half a mile away maybe. That's a long run. Get those legs moving, he silently urged himself as shots went off in the distance. Atticus didn't make it easy for them to hit him, running as fast as he was, peppering in a few stutter steps to break up the momentum. After the third shot, they stopped firing. He continued pumping his legs as hard as he could and chanced glancing back over his shoulder at the gunman just standing there, waiting. What the hell are you doing? Atticus thought, and a split second later, a four-wheel drive truck sped towards him, slamming on the brakes just beside the gunman. He hopped into the back and the truck hit the gas, speeding towards the running X-Ranger. 
The farmhouse was too far away to make it before the truck caught him, so he did the only thing he could do, stand and fight. Atticus turned and took aim with his shotgun, steadying himself despite the zombie mob marching towards him and the truck bearing down on him, less than a hundred yards away and closing. He took a deep breath, aiming at the front windshield. Finally, he pulled the trigger, the slug flying through the air and slamming into the glass, just off to the side of the driver's seat. The truck continued to bear down on him, picking up speed, the gunman in the back bouncing around while trying to get a shot and unable to. The truck was now within fifty yards of him as he steadied himself for another shot. Atticus fired again this time hitting the driver's side window. He didn't see a splatter of blood, however the truck veered off to the side at a dramatic angle. The engine whined as the gas pedal hit the floor, picking up speed as it approached the zombie mob. The truck hit a bump just before impact, sending it skyward, plowing through the middle of the mob, straight through to the other side. The impact caused the truck to roll over, sending the guy in the back flying out, slamming into the tundra. Atticus watched as the truck finally came to rest about twenty yards away from the mob, on its roof. Most of the ghouls broke away from their pursuit of Atticus, shambling towards the truck. Atticus, meanwhile, turned and booked it towards the farmhouse with several zombies still chasing him. As he ran, gunshots rapidly went off behind him. He continued tearing hard, getting within a few hundred yards of the farmhouse when more bullets whizzed too close to his head, forcing him to duck down. Atticus spun around, aiming the shotgun back towards the mob, which was mostly either dead or dispersed. Only a few small packs of ghouls were standing, moving towards different targets, himself included. He spotted the three remaining militia members coming towards him, still a hundred to a hundred and fifty yards away, and spread out pretty well. One of them was focused on taking out zombies that got too close, providing cover for the other two, who were trying to get a good shot on the ex-ranger. Pinned down, with no viable cover within reach, Atticus did the only thing he could do, which was to return fire. He aimed with his shotgun towards the leader, who had taken up a position behind a tree. He fired once, hitting the bark and sending splinters flying into the gunman's body. He quickly turned and fired towards the other one in pursuit, missing badly due to the quick trigger and distance, but just aiming in his direction was enough to get him to hit the ground. Atticus ditched the shotgun, out of shells on him, and started running as hard as he could towards the farmhouse, moving slightly from side to side to make a shot more difficult. He managed to get to the barbed wire fence by the driveway, leaping over it and rolling on the ground as the shots continued. He made a run over to the sedan, popping the trunk as he did, grabbing the shotgun and purse full of ammo, before taking cover on the other side of it. He quickly loaded up the shotgun and popped up over the front wheel well to see how close the enemy was. The lead militia member was about fifty yards away from the barbed wire fence, Atticus took careful aim, knowing he needed to hit this if he wanted to make it out of there alive. Rather than go for a center mass shot, he aimed a little lower. It was a risk, but one he needed to take. He fired, and the slug was on target, ripping into the man's upper leg and nearly ripping it off. He collapsed to the ground in pain, screaming loudly. His partner moved up, taking up a position beside his fallen comrade, aiming towards Atticus. You got two choices, the ex-ranger bellowed. You can keep fighting me and let your friend bleed out, or you can help him. I'm just passing through so you'll never see me again. I don't want to kill you, but you know I will if you make me. He looked past them, finding several zombies were still coming their way despite the best efforts of their other men. Better make your choice quick, because you got some company coming up. Atticus barked. He watched as the gunman glanced back at the zombies approaching. He hesitated, seeming to debate in his head what to do. Finally, he huffed and yelled out, Fine, but 
but I will string you up and feed you to those things if I ever see you again. Fair enough, Atticus yelled back. The man turned his sights on the zombies coming up from behind, aiming and putting them down one by one. As he did that, Atticus slipped into the car through the passenger seat, carefully sliding over towards the driver's side, starting it up and rolling down the window. He rested his handgun on the window sill carefully as he put the car into drive. He hit the gas, speeding down the driveway, half expecting a shot to come in his direction. But it didn't. When he reached the road, it was still thick with ghouls, and he made a hard right turn to the north just before the road, going off into the grass, where there were only a handful of zombies spread out in a wide arc. The car had just enough speed that it sent the creatures flying off of the front bumper, but not fast enough that they were getting caught underneath the car. It was a bumpy ride for about half a mile before the road opened up and he was able to get onto it. There were still packs of zombies, but he could weave in and out between them. A couple miles later, he spotted his dirt bike on the side road, still resting by the sign. Well, if they really want it, they'll know where it's parked, he said to himself, and breathed a sigh of relief as he sped back towards Spokane. Chapter 8 Atticus drove up towards the south barricade near the entrance to the city. As he got close, a couple of the guards came out, guns up, waving for him to stop, which he did. Who the hell are you and where did you come from? The first guard demanded. Atticus pulled out his special travel pass, showing it to them. Name's Atticus, and I'm allowed to be here, he said firmly. Would you be so kind as to radio Private Harwell and have him meet me at the transportation pool? The guard studied the pass and then shared a glance, shrugging, and the second one called up Harwell on the radio. We're kind of a hardened barricade here, the first guard said apologetically, so you won't be able to bring the car through. If you want to just park it over there, we can get you inside. Atticus nodded. Will do, he agreed, and parked, pulling out the shotgun and purse full of shells, slinging both over his shoulder and walking up to the barricade. The guards eyed him with confusion at the ridiculous floral bag. Yeah, I know, not really my color, but it does pack a punch, don't you think? He opened the bag to show them the few dozen shotgun shells inside. The second guard's eyes went wide as saucers, and he nearly melted. Oh my god, I haven't seen that many shells in forever, he gushed, staring. I... I don't suppose I could have a few, could I? Atticus cocked a brow. You short on twelve-gauge rounds? he asked. The first guy snorted. We're short on everything, he muttered. Atticus looked him in the eye, then back down the road towards the carnage he'd left in his wake. He sighed and handed over the entire bag, along with the shotgun. Why don't you boys hang on to all that for me, he said. They stared at it like kids with a bag of candy, nodding and blubbering profuse thanks. He held up a hand to stop them. Now, you make sure this gun stays at this post, he said firmly. I ran into a little bit of trouble down the road in Spangle, and some people might come looking for revenge. The first guard froze. Revenge? he asked. I tried to be peaceful, Atticus explained, but it didn't quite work out that way. Couldn't be avoided. The second guard pulled out his radio. We'll let the guards on the line know, he said and turned away to make the call. I am sorry if I bring that to your doorstep, Atticus said sincerely. Wasn't my intention. It's no problem, the first guard assured him. Not the first time troubles come a-knocking, and won't be the last. Atticus nodded and patted his shoulder, pausing right before he began to walk away. Oh, one more thing, he said. I know you boys are short on gas. That car over there has a full tank. Get you a hose and a couple of gas cans and you'll be in business. We're on it, the guard replied with a grin. Thank you. Atticus nodded and headed back to the transportation pool. As he entered the area, he spotted Private Harwell, whose brow furrowed in confusion when he noticed the man walking. Dirt bike not work out? he asked. Atticus shrugged. Worked fantastically. Just didn't make it the trip back, he said. No worries. We've lost a few ourselves. 
Harwell said. Oh, it's not lost, Atticus drawled. It's parked by the two-mile sign to Spangle. Must have been a hell of a hike back, Harwell said dryly. Would have been if I didn't steal a car, Atticus quipped. The private nodded in appreciation. You're resourceful, I'll give you that, he said. You find what you were looking for down there? Atticus nodded, pulling the ring out of his pocket and the slightly bent-up photo mailer, pulling it out to show him. He looked at the items, shaking his head in disbelief. You risk your life for these? he gasped. A picture and a ring? The ex-ranger shook his head. No, I risked my life so my little girl won't go hungry any time in the near future, he declared. The private blinked at him. Why would she go hungry? he asked. I thought they were handing out rations in Seattle. They are, but sometimes rations can go down, Atticus explained. Three meals becomes two, and then one if things get really lean. I'm just making sure we're stockpiled for a rainy day. So you're running errands for rations? Harwell asked. That's different. Atticus shrugged. It's what I know how to do, he said. Plus, they have me out here doing their bidding as well, so it's a win-win for everybody. Still, I wouldn't go around talking about it too much, especially amongst the rank and file, the private said, lowering his voice. Atticus blinked in confusion. Why not? he asked. Some of us are already down to two rations a day, several days a week, Harwell explained. The higher-ups are playing it off as just being extra cautious. Most of us have been in the service long enough to know that's a load of bullshit. They're starting with us because they know we can't say anything about it for fear of getting transferred to a clear team. The ex-ranger nodded slowly. Plus, I'd imagine they wouldn't want to worry the civilians, he mused. Last thing they could afford is a revolt. Exactly, Harwell said. While I'm hopeful for the best, I get the sense it's going to be a long, dark winter. Atticus saw the look in his eyes, rugged but with a hint of defeat in them. He reached into his pocket, pulling out a few ration coupons. He thumbed through them, peeling off three and handing them over to Harwell. It ain't much, but you helped me a great deal today, he said. Least I can do is get you fed. Harwell looked at the food tickets in his hand, nodding in appreciation before pocketing them and shaking Atticus's hand. You're a good man, he said firmly. You stay safe out there, and if you ever find yourself needing something in Spokane, ask for me personally. I'll do that, Atticus promised with a smile. You watch yourself now. The private nodded and Atticus headed back towards the train yard. Chapter 9 Atticus walked by Sergeant Miller, giving him a silent nod, not wanting to interrupt him as he was dealing with several people at the same time. As he walked back to the passenger car, he saw a small food stand by the side of the car. So, what do you have here? Atticus asked. The guy inside the cart grinned. One food ration will get you a bag of chips, a full 16-ounce cup of your choice of vegetable or chicken noodle soup, a mini-sized candy bar for dessert, and a bottle of water, he declared. Atticus nodded and pulled out a ration ticket, handing it over. Let me get the chicken noodle, he asked. He waited for a few moments as the guy dished out the soup and handed it over. Appreciate it, he said. The cart guy nodded back at him as Atticus gathered his spoils and headed towards the passenger car. There was a guard standing outside who stopped him, he juggled the food to pull out his pass and the guard waved him aboard once he looked it over. When Atticus got inside, he spotted a trio of troops at the far end of the car who were sitting around playing cards. He gave them a nod as he walked over to his seat, setting his big canvas bag onto the table. He opened it up, placing the ring and picture inside for safekeeping. He pulled out a notepad, finding that item on his list and drawing a line through it. One down, he thought. Not bad for a day's work. Atticus collapsed into the chair, propping his feet up on the chair in front of him and kicking back. He looked out the window at the activity in the train yard, seeing how hard everybody was working to rebuild things. In the back of his mind, however, he was concerned that what he had done in Spangle would come back to haunt him. Well, not particularly him, 
but blow back on these people who had nothing to do with it. You're overthinking, Atticus, he thought to himself. If those militia guys were already in Spangle, it was only a matter of time before they started pushing north. Plus, they were already agitated by some other stuff going on. Anything that was going to happen was going to happen anyway. He told himself that, even though he didn't really believe it. Still, it was the only thing he could do to keep himself focused and not dwelling on something that was out of his control. As he sat there pondering, a voice came over the PA system. All right, everybody, the announcer said. If you'd please take your seats, we're going to get underway. It's a bit of a haul to Helena, but I'll get you there as quickly as I can. I would say thank you for picking us as your transportation option, but we all know it's us or nobody. So thanks for not walking, I guess. Atticus chuckled, and the PA system clicked off, the beastly machine beginning to chug along. The scene outside began to glide by, the hustle and bustle of the train yard falling away and quickly replaced by long stretches of nothingness. Sure, there were buildings, businesses, and neighborhoods, but nothing was there outside of the occasional foot patrol. Two months ago, about this time of the day, there would have been a non-stop line of cars stretching as far as the eye could see. It didn't take long for the civilization portion of the trip to go away, replaced with scenic beauty, made all the more spectacular by the sun starting to get lower in the sky. This is beautiful to look at, but I really should start reading up on my next stop, Atticus thought with a sigh. Before he could reach into his bag, one of the soldiers approached him. Excuse me, sir, he asked politely. Atticus cocked a brow. Yes, soldier, he asked. I hope I'm not interrupting, he said, clasping his hands in front of him. But my buddies over there and I are playing some cards, and we noticed that you're the only other person on the train today. Just wanted to invite you over to join us. Atticus tilted his head back and forth. I appreciate it, but... Just so you know, the soldier plowed on. We're not playing for anything valuable or anything. I'm not trying to take your watch or nothing. My buddy Ben over there cleared out a bank a couple days ago and cleaned out one of the drawers, so we're using stacks of hundreds for our poker game. May not be worth anything now, but it's fun to feel like a high roller. Atticus glanced over, and one of the soldiers playfully held up a fan of hundreds, waving them in the air. One of the other men looked like he couldn't possibly be older than twenty-one. He finally nodded in agreement getting up from his seat. You know what? I've already worked enough today, he declared. Time to have a little fun. That's awesome, the soldier said, herding him back over to the table. Come on over, and I'll introduce you to the guys. Name's Atticus, the ex-ranger said with a wave. I'm Private Barnes, the soldier who had invited him said. And that's Private Jean and Private Kalfa. It's a pleasure, boys, Atticus said with the tip of his hat. Thanks for including me in your game. The soldiers nodded and said hello as he sat down, one of them sliding over several $10,000 stacks of $100 bills. We play dealer's choice, Jean said, and it's your deal. Atticus nodded and shuffled the cards in a very precise way, showing off. Well, boys, my name's Atticus Winward, he drawled. I'm from Texas, and I'm a purist. Texas Hold'em. Nothing's wild and a hundred dollar ante, and I apologize in advance for taking all your money. Bonds smirked. It's all good. I can always steal more, he quipped. They all broke out into laughter as Atticus dealt the cards. The day's danger was behind him, and there was a lot more ahead. But for the moment, he was going to kick back and enjoy life, even if it was just for a fleeting moment. The end.